thank you very much. It's, it's a delight to be here. I've had a really fascinating time so far in the, the past couple of days hearing about the world of von Neumann algebras, which I must confess I have not yet had much to do with up to now. So if I wanted to summarize this talk, well, this slide, this first title slide here, I think summarizes the emphasis of what's going on in this talk. Really, to get the top bit, I'm just going to tell you about tensor network states, and the towards should indicate that that's a work in progress. We're not going to get there, probably, towards the end of this talk. Now, if I wanted to summarize this whole uh, research program that I've been looking at in the past couple of years, well, I guess the word would be deja vu. <laughs> I, um, a year and a half ago, I, uh, one of my students was in uh, California, and he came back and he said, I saw this fantastic talk by Vaughan Jones. You have to check it out. So I, I, I went online, and I managed to get the video file to download, which was non-trivial. And I was amazed to see that so many of the things that Vaughan was talking about were familiar. And in fact, they were like identical in part to the, some of the questions that I've been trying to engage with in the past couple of years. And so this was really a, a hugely motivating motivating thing for me, you know, there are other people out there who are interested in similar questions. Is this a vertex? Is this a vertex? <laughs> <laughs> it's an opera. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, well, let me explain a little bit the, the, my background before we get into things. So I'm a, I'm a quantum information theorist by training. I got my, my PhD in quantum information theory. I have some mathematical background, some physical background. I call myself a physicist today rather than a mathematician. And in the past 15 years, I've been focused on building one of these things. And furthermore, once we've built one of these things, finding things for this thing to do. So what is this thing? It's a quantum computer. This is one of the, the uh, jo Josephson junction-based qubit quantum computers of John Martinez. And there's four qubits here in these Josephson junctions, there, there, and there. Now, four qubits isn't very much. Uh, but we're, we're, we're hopeful. I'm, I'm super optimistic. We've had. Uh, lots and lots of progress in, in quantum information theory in recent years, and we're going to go places. And I think within, within a decade, we're going to see the first quantum com computers. Now, I'm not here to tell you about quantum computation. I would love to. This would be another talk, another five talks, where we're at at the moment. Very fascinating topic. Instead, I want to tell you about an offshoot of quantum information theory, one that, that we're very excited about in the, the quantum information community. We, and that is com an offshoot coming from thinking about quantum mechanics. So in building a quantum computer, you have to think about quantum mechanics quite deeply, and then you want, you're, you're, you're led to sort of gain a different perspective on some of the older questions of quantum mechanics. And then you, you naturally, I think, it, it, it's, it's tempting to say, maybe some of these new ideas we have in quantum information theory, maybe they have applications somewhere else. And so I want to tell you a story about exciting developments that full work in progress, there's nothing pinned down yet about how we're taking ideas of quantum entanglement and applying them to understand complex quantum many-body systems. And I'm going to tell you what all these things are. But before I do that, I want to put the heavy disclaimer. As a physicist, I know I will speak and I'll use terminology and I will discuss things in a way that are disorienting and maybe unfamiliar to a mathematical audience. And so to help you through this talk, I'm going to introduce a character Dr. Strange Qubit, now his, his role in this talk is to warn you that I'm going to make a statement that isn't rigorous, right? In fact, it, whenever he appears in the, the, the upper right corner, you know that I'm not telling you something uh, with a clean definition and with a clean proof. Instead, I'm going to tell you stuff that's based on physical intuition, experience with examples, or just plain guesswork. And here's your guide through this talk. So when he's there, you know that, that what I'm saying is you cannot be rigorized, right? This is just, I'm, I'm reporting from the trenches of, of engagement with quantum many-body systems, and I'm just telling you stuff we've seen. And why am I doing that? Because, as we heard in Vaughan's talk this morning, there's this thing called the, the Kadanoff renormalization, Bosch-Kin renormalization group. It's something we also encounter quite often in our studies. And about 10 years ago, we also had the same problem that, that Vaughan mentioned. This, this continuity problem has, a, has, a, has an analog in, a, in our field. And we've been engaging with this problem in the past 10 years. And I'm, I wanted to report to you some of the development, developments that have occurred in our field <coughs> in trying to engage with these, these problems that, that, that the, the standard Kadanoff renormalization group 
has and how we've dealt with them and how maybe this is a way forward to, to, to go past this, this roadblock that Paul described this morning. So I'll give you now the very high level uh, motivation for this talk. What, what my personal motivation comes from quantum fields. I'm very interested in them. I wanted to be a high energy theorist, not a quantum information theorist. Things didn't go that way. I ended up being a quantum information theorist instead, but I never lost you know, that place in my heart for this first love of high energy physics. And it was with great delight that I realized in the past five years or so that maybe you know, some of the stuff we're doing in quantum information theory might have applications for studying quantum fields. Now, when I say quantum fields, uh, I'm going to adopt a, a, a formulation of quantum field theory that I would say is, is, is predominant amongst physicists today. So if you ask a physicist today, how do you think about quantum field theory, then they're like as not a practicing physicist to say, well, no, quantum field theory is effective. What does effective? So we don't think of quantum field theory as usually as a fundamental theory anymore in practicing physics, particularly in many body theory. We think of it, we tend to think of it as an effective theory. And what's that? Well, it's something you get by adjusting a regulated theory. I'll tell you what that is in a second. By increasing a thing called a cutoff while preserving things called low energy predictions. So I'm going to explain all this terminology to you. So for the moment, this is the high level view. You're not meant to understand what I'm saying. Just, 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 just let it wash over, right? So what do I mean by regulated model? Well, I mean lattice models. So this is, a, uh, this is the, exactly the, the form of regulated models we're going to have in this talk. We met lattice models this morning. Quantum spin systems are the lattice models of my choice. And they're characterized by a bunch of degrees, quantum degrees of freedom arranged in a regular lattice with some lattice space in A, which is the inverse of this thing called the cutoff, lambda is this thing called the cutoff. And how do we take uh, uh, this, this uh, how do we increase the cutoff of a lattice theory? Well, that's easy, right? You just let the lattice spacing go to zero. Right? You can even draw it on, on the slide, I didn't do that. And how do you fix large scale low energy predictions? Well, these are directly proportional to things called endpoint correlation functions. I'll define those in a second as well. And so what you wanna do is you wanna find a, a way of getting denser and denser lattices where the lattice spacing goes to zero while preserving a thing called the correlation length. Because this is the quantity that would ensure that these, these, uh, these high energy, uh, low, low energy large scale predictions remain preserved. And that actually leads you to a thing called the second order quantum phase transition. Because lattice systems with this property that as you increase some parameter, the correlation length increases. I mean, this is the bare minimum that we would need for this Wilsonian thing to work. Uh, these are, uh, this is a phenomenon exhibited by a thing called a quantum second order quantum phase transition. I'll tell you what that is as well in this talk. And so it is that Wilson teach, taught us physicists to understand quantum field theories really as being synonymous with second order quantum phase transitions, whatever that word means, these words mean. But I think, you know, even to a physical audience, this should throw up questions, right? You should be you should be puzzled by what I just said. You shouldn't be like, oh yes, this is clear. I mean, to many physicists, this is super satisfying because it took something that we didn't really understand so particularly well. I mean, quantum field theory is not exactly a mature field. There's lots of different formulations. There's lots of arguments about how we should uh, write it down even in the physical community. And, and it says, well, no, I mean, it's just equivalent to these things called second order phase transitions. So the question that you should be burning in your mind immediately is like, what is a second order quantum phase transition? Right? What is this thing? What does it mean, low energy predictions? What does it mean, adjust the cutoff? All these words need to be dealt with, even on a physical level. And so the long-term goal of this talk is to understand second order quantum phase transitions and to report to you progress on re understanding these things. And the, the, the sort of picture of the talk and of also the, the way we've been approaching this problem is as follows. You start with defining these things, second order quantum phase transition, by saying what is the models that exhibit these things. I'll introduce you local Hamiltonians. You've seen them already this morning. Then I'll, I'll, I'll give you some characteristics of second order quantum phase transitions. Then I'll tell you about things called tensor networks. And there the deja vu shall rise. And right at the end, the scaling limit, uh, I will use this, all this discussion to motivate this thing called the semi-continuous limit, uh, which is for this audience kind of like one slide, right? Because you've seen this mathematical object before. It's a natural thing for you. In a physics talk, I would spend 90% of my time here and so like 10% here. So I'm going to invert the, the usual time I spend on this talk. Uh, he's, he's, not, uh, he's not hiding there. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, that, that the statement I make at the end will not, not be uh, based on physical intuition and guesswork. So that's the, that's the idea. 
So let's, let's run through again. You know, the best form of encoding is repetition encoding. I'm just going to say everything that Vaughn said again. Uh, just to, to, to make sure that the, the message is clear. So let's start off by de de defining some kinematics. This is the basic configuration for our quantum systems that we're going to study for the rest of this course. So the kin kinematics for our, our systems is based on a thing called the qubit. That's a qubit, but with d levels, right? You can otherwise think of this as spin d over two particles. And the Hilbert space, the space of configurations for this thing, definition, per definition, is c to the d. What if you have n of them? If you have a quantum spin system, well, uh, wait, I'll, I'll get to some notation before that. Uh, Qubit states, right, what are they? Well, they're, they're rays in this vector space, but typically we sort of work with unnormalized states uh, in the physical community, so we, we blur the line between rays and vectors. Uh, so we have these things called Qubit states, they're just vectors in the Hilbert space. Of course, I'm an inveterate physicist, so you're going to have to, I apologize now, endure the Brackett notation in this course. Uh, I hope it's, you've at least encountered it and it's something familiar to you. Uh, so what if you have any Qubits or any quantum spins? What's the configuration space for such a system? Well, you just take CD and tensor n times. N distinguishable quantum spins, per definition, it, we attach this Hilbert space to it. Okay, done. That was the kinematics for our system. We've seen this this morning already. What about dynamics? How does this thing change as time progresses? Well, you need to introduce a thing called a Hamiltonian, so now I'm going to tell you what that is. So in particular, I'm not going to tell you about Hamiltonians full stop. I'm going to tell you about a special subclass of Hamiltonians called local Hamiltonians. And these are the, the central objects of study in condensed matter theory in quantum information theory. So why would we introduce these things at all? Well, because after long toil and sweat by physicists, we now know that local Hamiltonians model quantum computers, the evolution of quantum computers. That's a very important comment here. They model ultra-cold magnets and dilute atomic gases. They model topological quantum field theories, although I cannot claim to understand this completely. And they also model uh, regulated quantum fields, which are the, somehow the building block of what the Wilsonian view of quantum field theory is. So let's give a definition for these things. I can do that. Uh, a, a, a local Hamiltonian is a, is a self adjoint operator. But before I tell you what uh, additional structure this self adjoint operator has. I have to introduce some minor terminology. So if you have some, some operator on this Hilbert space here, then the support of that is the smallest set of tensor product factors such that you can write A as something tensor the identity. Okay. And so we, we usually write S for the support of A. And what then is a local Hamiltonian? Well, a local Hamiltonian is some self adjoint operator, a Hermitian matrix, right? Where it's all finite dimensional here, guys, right? You know, linear algebra is, is, is my is the extent of my Fermoian algebra ability. So uh, we've got a Hermitian matrix. There's m terms. m is just uh, m is bounded, as it's sort of trivially, above by a function of the number of spins, where each of these hj's is, de is required to have a, a constant support, size support. Now, constant for this talk actually means 2. So for the rest of this talk, constant will be 2, although it can be 3 or 4 or 5 or some number that doesn't scale with the number of particles around. <laughs> nearest neighbor interactions would be an example, but we're not restricting ourselves at this point to nearest neighbor interactions. The interactions could be all over the shop, right? Maybe they could be, you know, between 1 and 10, 2 and 6, and so on. To make, to get to this nearest neighbor world, we have to, like, imp use some additional data. Yes, we, we live in 3 plus 1 space-time dimensions in this condition for string theories, in which case we want to uh, make sure that our Hamiltonians respect this spatial geom geom geometric locality. So there we put an additional constraint on these Hamiltonians, namely that they are sums of pairwise interaction terms which act only on neighboring spins, say j and j plus 1. So I have a picture here. The spins in this talk live on intervals of the line. This is a bit maybe divergent from other depictions of lattice models. Now I've put some additional notation on this slide. I'm allowing, in this talk, these Hamiltonians to depend on some real number lambda. Lambda is a real number. And they're allowed to depend in some potentially crazy way on lambda, hopefully continuous and differentiable. Uh, but actually, it turns out that you can more or less create that a linear dependence on lambda. So we saw an example of one of these models this morning, um, sort of. It, it would, was the antiferromagnetic Heisenberg model, in, in which case, um, 
we would have some particular equation for this. I'm going to write out a different example. This is one that we, we tend to like in, especially for the context of this talk, a little more. So 1, 0, 0, minus 1, quantity of identity. a model called the transverse easing model. This is the world's simplest quantum phase transition. We'll get to this. Uh, here it's a magnetic field, an external magnetic field. All right. Well, okay. So I, I've, I've, I've announced that I'm not doing proper von Neumann algebras here. It's, it's all matrices from here on out. A local Hamiltonian. What is it? Well, it's just a d to the n by d to the n Hermitian matrix. Okay. How hard can this be? So it's mostly sparse. It's, 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 it's even not even a general Hermitian matrix. And so while I was preparing this talk, I just tapped in a model like this transverse easing model into to MATLAB, and I plotted the sparsity pattern of an eight-spin uh, example of one of these models just to give you a feeling for what these matrices look like. And they have this very characteristic sort of fractal pattern here for their sparsity pattern. So you know, I've colored the entries here according to whether they're zero or non-zero. And looking at this picture, yeah, I find it highly suggestive. So I once calculated the fractal dimension of these things. It was something like 1.12 or something like that. So it, it, they're kind of one-dimensional things. So there's structure there, and we can exploit that structure. But not enough. Because if you take one of these matrices and you stick it into MATLAB and you ask it to diagonalize the matrix, which is the task that makes all the physics trivial, then you run into a brick wall and a really solid, heavy brick wall. So I've got, uh, I did this as I was preparing this talk. I tried it a 16 spin chain. I put one of these models in and I asked MATLAB to diagonalize it with Intel's top CPU, which basically meant it was the most powerful CPU in the world. And with the most amount of RAM you can shove on a desktop computer and it hits the brick wall. I was immediately floppy. There's nothing you can do about it. You, well, if you exploit some symmetries and so on, you can get a bit further. There is a brick wall around 32 spins. We're never going to get it, get past it, because Moore's law is faltering. I don't know if you're looking at the, the tech media at the moment. Moore's law is in trouble, and it's not clear if we're going to it's going to continue. So we're not going to get extra spins to see. This is why we need a quantum computer. Um, I want. I'm going to mention a, a constraint. We're doing linear algebra here, so we're asking. What we're doing is we're asking hard questions about simple things. And how are we making our lives harder than in the von Neumann algebra world? Well, we're, we're going to impose additional constraints on the complexity of the tasks we're allowed to do. So we're not, we can't just say unitarily equivalent in the quantum information world. We have to say that the unitary that makes these two things equivalent can be uh, evaluated with a number of arithmetic operations which scales roughly polynomially with the number of spins, which we call E. Now, I could give a full two lectures on doing this within the, uh, the formalism of complexity theory to get this perfectly rigorous. However, look, he's here, so you, you, um, it, you know that you're just going to use this as intuition. And if a, a unitary takes an exponential number of arithmetic operations to evaluate, then we call it hard. So this is the extra constraint that we put on, on, on our linear algebra questions. So now let's, get, let's circle back towards quantum phase transitions. What are these things? Okay, well, I have to give you some additional data to, to even describe them. Firstly, I need to tell you about a thing called the ground state. What is that? Well, you take your matrix, you get the spectral decomposition, you find the eigenvector corresponding to the lowest eigenvalue. That's the thing we call the ground state. There's the eigenvalues lined up in ascending order. What about another thing? Well, we have another thing that's crucial for talking about quantum phase transitions is the spectral gap. What is this thing? Just take the first two eigenvalues, subtract them, and that's a positive number. That's the spectral gap. And the third thing, a little bit more complicated, is the thing called the correlation function. It's a quadratic function of the state omega in this talk. It doesn't have to be, but it is for this talk. Uh, take two of your favorite Hermitian operators acting on tensor factor of j, tensor factor k. Support of a is j, support of b is k. Uh, compute this inner product. Subtract this thing off. That's the two-point connected correlation function. There's an endpoint version, which I think is natural to imagine what that might be. And we have a picture usually for this thing. We, we think of A as being an observable of the system of the spin at site J and K at uh, uh, B at site K in this long chain. And this connected correlation function tells us how much the measurement result of measuring this observable here can be inferred from 
the measurement results of the observable B measures its site type. So these are three crucial definitions we need to talk about quantum phase transitions. Now, why do we want to do that? Remember Wilson. Wilson taught many physicists that quantum field theories are just low-energy effective theories of these things that they're worth, that they're worth talking about. And, uh, well, you know, the tension rises. What is a quantum phase transition? <laughs> so I, when I was a PhD student, my supervisor, Michael Nielsen, he says, okay, quantum phase transitions are really interesting. How about you just go and learn about them? Here's the, the canonical textbook on this subject. And so with, you know, with some excitement, I ran to the library, got the book, opened up chapter one, definition, a quantum phase transition is blah, 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 blah. Great, I thought I understood this. Then I moved to chapter two, read a bit, then chapter three, definition, quantum phase transition is blah, 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 blah. I was like, hang on. That second definition looks a bit different from the first. So it, this, is, this, is, this is not a coincidence. Even amongst physicists, the word quantum phase transition, I would argue, doesn't have a universally accepted definition. It's a bit like pornography. You know it when you see it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, what are we going to do? Well, it, it, it's tough, right? So we, we're still struggling. We're still exploring examples, trying to understand what this thing is, quantum phase transition. And I can, all I can do is report to you some features. So what do they have? Well, they occur, they can, they occur in a thing called the ground state, at a thing called a critical point for this parameter lambda. And they only occur when, the, the, when you have a number of spins going to infinity. So yes, we are sort of lurking closer and closer to the polynomial algebra around here. What else do we know about them? Well, they, these two-point correlation functions, as we reach the phase transition, uh, become scale invariant and they just decay polynomially with the separation. Except that's not even true. There exist quantum phase transitions where that's not actually true. So that's one of the problems we have. But let's, let's just take that as our caricature of what, what a quarter phase transition ought to do. And uh, also, they're, they're usually associated with a spectral, uh, vanishing spectral gap. In fact, that's more or less a necessity. So this one, yeah, you can argue about it. And, and this one, well, you know, there, there are quarter phase transitions which occur not just in the ground. It's, it's complicated. You know, there's, there's lots of stuff that we want to call quarter phase transition that don't quite get captured by these observations. But let's just use this as our working caricature of what a quantum phase transition actually is. So that leads us finally now to our main task. Given a local quantum Hamiltonian, we want to understand the ground state, or the low, at least the low energy space for this. And what is that? Well, it's a family. And I want to emphasize this word. So a, when studying quantum phase transitions, you don't just have one model, one ground state. You actually have in mind a family, a two-parameter family, not even a one-parameter family. So you have two parameters here, n and lambda. And we care about. This, this, these eigenvectors for all n and lambda, especially those values of lambda going to this critical point. Right. Now, let me, that's the goal, right? That's, that's our concrete task that we have to engage with. Let's now start, I'll, I'll start now reporting to you some of the results we have towards this goal. So why do we even think that this is the doable goal? Well, because of this. You know, it might have been the case that this was an intractable problem because just about any vector in Hilbert space could be realized as the ground state of a local Hamiltonian. Maybe, maybe that's the case. Well, it's not, actually. And so this is, this is the first remarkable result that I think is worth pointing out that gives us uh, the motivation to continue on this, 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 this task. And it's, it's a theorem. I mean, I won't quote it as a theorem here. I'll just quote the result. But uh, th this is a theorem that tells us that ground states of these things are not generic. They're not, not, not things that appear anywhere in, in, in Hilbert space. They occupy a very special tiny corner of Hilbert space. So remember, many particle Hilbert space is this vast dimension, right, d to the n, when d is 2 and n is 32. That's the wall. We can't get past that. But the volume of physical states, these are the ones that can be prepared on quantum computers or the ones that appear as ground states of local Hamiltonians or anything like this. It's a teeny weeny fraction of this vast Hilbert space. So the argument goes, you stick a whole bunch of little epsilon balls in, in norm around these physical states, you sum up them all up, and you work out the volume. It's a simple counting argument, essentially due to uh, analogous to the argument of Shannon that a Boolean, random Boolean function is not generic. And uh, that, 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 that there are two doubly exponentially many Boolean functions. And you learn that the fraction in, in the measure induced on Hilbert space by Haar measure is teeny weeny 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 fraction. So the fraction of states that the universe will ever access, right? Because we believe the universe is modeled by a local Hamiltonian, 
as time passes, our universe will never escape from this teeny weeny little yellow blob in Hilbert space. All these other states in Hilbert space, they're, they'd never be touched. And so this is a, a, a huge sort of uh, uh, validation of, a, of an approach that I'm about to, to describe, which is how do we parameterize this yellow set? You know, we want to do physics, we want to construct things and predict things and measure things and model things. And we can't do that if we need d to the n complex numbers. But this, this observation here allows us to introduce a very clever parameterization of that space that allows us to do physics. And this parameterization is a p-dotted tensor network. So here I hope the deja vu level will begin to rise because these things should look pretty familiar. Right, so what, but before I tell you what they are, let me tell you why I, we, we care about tensor networks. Because we've learned after trial and error and, and lots of observations that they're giving us an efficient parameterization of this physical corner of Hilbert space. So they're a useful thing. Now what are they? Well, uh, we've seen them this morning actually. Vaughan already introduced tensor networks essentially. Uh, so they're built from atoms. The atom is an end index, end index tensor which is just for this talk, right? It's just a list of complex numbers. It's not, uh, it's nothing to do with the differential geomet geometric uh, in index tensors, it's just a list of complex numbers. And we use this picture to denote, to, to depict such in index tensors. It's a blob, we label it with the, the name of the tensor, Vaughan had the, the name outside the blob, I have the name inside the blob, small differences. Uh, the legs uh, have got uh, labeled by the indices and you can think of it as a box, you stick the, in, the, na uh, the values of the index in and it gives you the complex number. And in keeping with this constraint of complexity, like we have this extra constraint when we do our linear algebra, that has, things have to be done efficiently. I have to tell you what, what's the hardness parameter in this talk and it's gonna be a thing called the bond dimension. So the bond dimension of an n-index tensor is just the largest dimension of these, these legs here. So that immediately allows you to infer that you've got less than da to the power n parameters in an n-index tensor. Well, n-index tensors are all very well, but a tensor network as the name implies, is more than one. So how do we put them together? Well, we use the tensor product, the straight out Kronecker product. And how do we stick them together? So it's all very well to have any independent tensors. Well, we contract, we sum over repeated indices to build other tensors. And you need, the, of course, the dimensions of the, this, this leg here and this leg here are the same, otherwise this dimension doesn't work. And we have a picture for that, which we also saw this morning. If I have an N tensor and an M index tensor, then the tensor contraction of A and B on one leg is this M plus N minus two index tensor with this diagram like that. So the super, uh, there's more than a superficial similarity between planar algebras and tensor networks. This is sort of one of the things that excited me when I heard about these planar algebras. Like, wow, you know, th th there's all this developed theory out there. Maybe you know, if we can exploit this, this, this similarity, maybe we can really learn something also in the, ten the tensor networks world. Okay, so let's give you some examples of tensor networks. We've seen them already, but it, it doesn't hurt to see them again. Here, a vector, what is it? It's a one index tensor with, a, with, with one, one, one leg. A matrix, two index tensor, J, K, rho, column. What happens when you multiply a matrix times a vector? Well, that's a tensor contraction of a matrix with a vector. And well, there's another one, scalar product. That's, it's also a tensor network. It's just a, num it's a number, a zero index tensor. So what is a tensor network then? For us, a tensor network is an N index tensor M built from the contraction of a list of tensors A1 through to AM. So here's a picture of a tensor network. It's a five leg tensor. And underneath the hood, we've got all these tensors here that we've contracted together to get that tensor. And we have a definition. The bond dimension of one of these tensor networks is the largest of the bond dimensions of the constituent tensors a crucial number in all discussions of tensor network theory. Now, what's a tensor network state, right? You know, I've talked about tensor networks, now it's tensor network state. Well, if you take a state in our n particle quantum Hilbert space, then you expand it in some convenient orthonormal basis, which is a product basis, which is very important, then you, you end up needing these numbers, psi j1 through to n, well, that's a tensor, right? That's an n index tensor. So a tensor network state is any, ten is any state whose coefficient psi is a tensor network, right? End of definition. Well, th that's a, a pretty empty definition because just about anything is right. Anything's got a tensor network, it's a bit boring. So 
So actually, this, this whole theory gets its richness from the examples. And I'm going to run through three examples very uh, relatively rapidly. We've seen them before uh, in various guises in the, in the, the first two talks, in the first talk. So the matrix product states, this was the original. This was, this is a tensor network state. It, it's also called finitely correlated state, uh, where this psi here has this characteristic product form like this here. Very similar to transfer matrices. In fact, when you compute expectation values with these matrix product states, you end up having to do a transfer matrix calculation. So there's more than a superficial similarity here. And that these a, these we had some terminology for these kind of things. Uh, we, uh, you might hear me say physical leg for these, these bonds coming out, and you might hear me say virtual leg for the bonds that are contracted over. And the dimension, the large, the bond dimension of this network is, is D. I'll say that, that I don't think I define that in a later slide. Okay, what, what sort of properties do these things have? What gives the, the theory its richness? Well, they can be specified, and this is crucial, with a linear in the number of particle, particles, number of com complex parameters. So that's great, right? We can specify these things in, in, in an efficient way. We can compute expectation values efficiently. This is very important. It's all very well to specify a state, but if you can't compute anything, then, well, not great. Uh, they give good reproduction. This is only if you know these words of quantum correlations and quantum entanglement in ground states of certain models, as I'll show in a minute. And but here's a feature that should sort of ring alarm bells: Do these have anything to do with quantum phase transitions? Probably not, because they have exponentially decaying correlation points. All right, here's some. I'll just give you a sample of some of the results we have about matrix product states. There's quite a few now extant in, in the literature. Lots of fascinating theories we, we, uh, theorems we know about matrix product states and why we think they're a good thing. Here's just a sample of two. This is to do with integrating the Schrodinger equation. Suppose you have some geometrically one-dimensional quantum Hamiltonian. You allow, and you have some initial state psi naught. I didn't write it here, where psi naught is a product state. And you ask, how does this system evolve in time? You know, well, according to the Schrodinger equation, which is just this unitary operator here. Uh, what do we know about this psi t? Well, it turns out that there exists always a matrix product state which is close to this exact evolution with this dependence on the, the parameters. And that means that as time progresses, it's exponentially more difficult to represent the state as a matrix product state. Uh, it's polynomially more difficult as you increase the system size. But if you're, if you're willing to make the tensor network bigger, then you can suppress this, 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 this poor behavior and norm by making your matrix product state bond dimension larger. So this is, this is a, a sort of a priori justification of why lots of numerical methods work with matrix product states. Another theorem uh, proposition is this, this relatively well-known one in our community, which says that ground states of geometrically one-dimensional Hamiltonians with a non-vanishing spectral gap, they're also well approximated by these matrix product states. This is a very tough theorem. Here's the dependence on the parameters. It's ex again exponential in the inverse spectral gap. You, you, you pay hard. You pay hard for the, your, your gap in this representation. There is a higher dimensional version of matrix product states called projected entangled pair states. These are fascinating objects. I put this example up here because it's not planar. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and to illustrate that, that to, to make the argument that this is a useful thing and we've used it, however, it's very difficult to say anything about these networks. That's rigorous. There's a, however, they're extremely useful in practice and have been very, very successful. What I want to do instead is tell you about a third type of tensor network. Now, this is the most fascinating one of all for me in the context of quantum order, second order quantum phase transition. It's called the multi scale entanglement renormalization. It was introduced by Gifrey Vidal in 2000, and let's say one. It took him many years to, to get to publishing this. Uh, what, are, what do we need to define them? Well, we need a thing called a unitary. So we're going to build it out of tensors, but these tensors are going to have more structure than you, you, the tensors we've had so far. So far, the tensors we've had were just lists of complex numbers. Now they're going to have more, more properties. So we're going to build our mirrors from unitaries with four legs and isometries with three legs. We've, met, we've seen these isom isometries like this this morning. What does it mean, unitary isometry? It means that if you contract these guys, you just get the identity. If you contract this guy, you get the identity. What then is a mirror? This is a mirror. I just draw the picture up. So this, this, is, this has got a, it, there's many fascinating properties of this tensor network. Well, look, it, it's, it's got rank. Here's the physical leg here. And then you, you apply a rank of the product of these unitaries. 
the, these unitaries are called disentanglers. The, the origin of the terminology is not important. Uh, then you apply a theme to a rank of isometries and then disentanglers in isometries and disentanglers in isometries. That's how you, you produce a mirror tensor network. Now, the tensor network we saw this morning, due to, to essentially due to Kavanaugh, Migdal, Kavanaugh, Wilson, uh, was exactly like this, but where the unitaries were the identities. And that's, this is the, the, the key difference. See, we understood in the quantum information community, we had the same problems, right? We were, this, this Kadanoff migdal tensor network were just no good at explaining the physics of, of critical local Hamiltonians. And it was Giffray who realized that the, the missing element was that this entanglement, which is produced by these unitaries here, was missing. So one of the, the, the key problems with the, the migdal kadanoff tensor network is if you cut through this network here, you can find places where you only cut one leg. Now that's actually bad. I, I, I would love to go into the details of why that's bad and why that doesn't uh, faithfully represent ground state physics. I won't be able to do that for this talk, but that, I, I claim that was bad. And I in understanding how to, to create something that, that fixed up that problem, so now when you cut anywhere, you're gonna have to cut at least sort of log number of bombs, we, we, we found a tensor network which had more chance of explaining ground state physics of critical lattice models. So it's a complete generalization of this Migdal Kadanoff Wilson box thing idea. So here's some properties of these guys, and this is you know more exciting. Like when I heard about these things, I was like, wow, this is amazing, right? Because you can specify them with very few parameters. All you need to do is specify u and v for each rank. I mean, here I've drawn the u's and v's the same on every level, but they're allowed to differ. You can efficiently compute expectation values. Indeed, you can compute all endpoint correlation functions. I mean, like wow, right? You, this is this is very rarely happening in physics that you get to compute all correlation functions. Usually you're stuck with approximations. It gives good reproduction of the quantum correlations of, of ground states. It exhibits polynomially decaying correlation functions, which was a real revolution when, when, when this was developed. We only had exponential up to then. And they are non-Gaussian. So Gaussian is, is the only other class of states I know that allows you to compute endpoint correlation functions by Wick's theorem. These states are not Gaussian, they're manifestly not Gaussian. I mean compute with a computer, right? Yeah, o okay, right. I realize your, your question, of course, makes it clear there's other ways of interpreting what I just said. So when I say compute, I mean compute efficiently on a computer or even with pencil and paper. I don't mean it in the, the, the Gerdelian sense of computability. Uh, all right, let me give you an example of a computation that we can do with Mera, just so you can get a feel for why they're so useful and how they work. We, we saw a similar computation this morning. Suppose I want to compute this two-point correlation function. That's the inner product of some psi with itself in this case. So we have psi mirror. We have our two-point correlator. We need to work out this expectation value. And as Vaughan explained, to do that in a tensor network type picture, what you do is you take your tensor network for mirror and put it on the bottom, apply your tensor network for A and B, which is sort of straightforwardly these these lines with these A's, and then you sandwich this bra version on the, top, on the left, and that just means flipping the whole picture, and then contract. So why would this be easy? Well, let's look. Well, we've got lots of cancellations to exploit, right? The U's, they cancel themselves, so we can get eliminate all those U's. In doing so, this B spreads a bit, right? And it's no longer on this line, it now spreads to two lines. So it's a four index tensor, and this A spreads to two lines as well. It's now a four index tensor there. And now look, ah, we've got isometries again. We can cancel those. And this A spreads again to a four index tensor, and B spreads again to a four index tensor. So on the basis of this one example, you might be willing to conjecture, maybe you can always do this with A and B spreading to four index tensors all the way to the top. That's almost true. If you're a bit more careful, you see that you can always contract these tensor networks with A and B spreading to six index tensors. It's not immediately obvious, but I, I, a little bit of playing and you, you, you'll, you'll convince yourself of this fact. Let's draw some Venn diagrams. With the same number of parameters, a mirror is more expressive than a matrix product space in one geometric dimension. In two dimensions, this PEFS is a more expressive class of states with the same number of variational parameters than the two-dimensional version of a mirror. 
is a, a strange inversion here. It just tells us maybe that PIPs is maybe not quite the, the, the right way of generalizing the MPS. Now, let me tell you about, so, so let me report to you from the trenches. We've, there's been extensive numerical uh, studies with, with sensor networks like NERA. And what I can tell you is that if you've got a, a, a ground state of a geometrically one-dimensional Hamiltonian undergoing a second-order quantum phase transition, then there exists a NERA which will approximate this. With, uh, and by well approximate, I mean in norm. And by, uh, I didn't have the word efficient there, it should say which well approximates omega n lambda efficiently uh, in the sense of polynomials in number of n spins. Okay, that's what we've observed studying model after model after model, the ones, uh, the models based on transfer operators, models not based on transfer operators, and beta unworked. And this is great, right? What I'd love to write how, here, however, is a proposition or a theorem, but unfortunately, all I can say, give you is not even a conjecture because I still haven't gotten round to actually defining what does this word mean, the ground state of a model undergoing a second order quantum phase transition. So it's not even a conjecture, sadly. Now let's, in the last part of this talk, I guess I've got, what, five minutes? Yeah, I'll try and, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a lot to do, but I'm just gonna stop, right? I'm gonna try and get round to giving you a definition. You know, I'm gonna actually uh, take the experience we've got to provide a de definition of what is a second order quantum phase transition and use this mirror as a guide. And to do that, we're gonna have to talk about scaling limits. What do these things look like? If you zoom up, as, as Vaughan mentioned today, on the, ma on the spins in a quantum magnet, you can see the spins sort of, you know, your, your eyes, are, you've got scanning, tunneling, electron microscope eyes or something. You can see that, that the spin, you're convinced that this is a spin chain, right? You're seeing the spins flipping around in front of your eyes. But if you zoom out a bit and you, you have in your hands or, uh, uh, some material, you know it's made of atoms because some physicist told you, but every experiment you do on this convinces you that it's actually a continuum, right? It's, it's fluid, right? You're, you don't have Superman eyes. You, you look at this fluid and it, yeah, look, velocity field, yep, pressure field, it's continuous, I'm convinced. That's in three dimensions, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's three dimensions. <laughs> and you, you're completely convinced by this fact because the experiments you can do don't permit you to interrogate the system at a smaller scale. The continuum model is a good, effective model for this complex system only because you cannot do every observ observation of the system. I'll cut round back to that topic later. All right, second order quantum phase transitions, escape, we need to talk about scaling limits. We need to talk about zooming out and measuring fewer observables. So I'll try and give you as clean a definition as I can. Here's some, let H, N, lambda be a family of 1D Hamiltonians with one of these things happening at the critical point. Let, let's just choose a sequence of, of these, these, these uh, functions lambda just for the sake of argument, make it monotone, increasing, let's say. And then that gives us a family of ground states. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna allow our system size to increase at the same rate that we're making this parameter go to this critical point. So we're taking a sort of double scaling limit. And then we look at this correlation function and I'm still reporting to you uh, uh, intuition gained from experience. We know that these things uh, are some polynomial decaying function multiplied by an envelope, an exponential envelope, and this number here is this correlation length. But I can't give you, this is not a rigorous definition because even these words don't, don't quite make sense yet. And what can I observe about quantum phase transitions? Well, as I said earlier, that the, the, this correlation length goes to infinity. And what does Wilson tell us, just to remind you, You've got to fix these large endpoint correlation functions while allowing your system to get bigger and going to this quantum phase transition. And that tells you what the lattice spacing is associated with this system. So let me just give you a little schematic of how we do this in practice. We take our model on some L spins. We work out its ground state. We, from the ground state, we work out this correlation length. Then we rescale the lattice uh, so that the, the product of the lattice spacing and the correlation length is some constant, K1. And you repeat, 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 and that's how you do a continuum or scaling limit. Now let's actually try and build a kinematical space for this to take place in. So I'm gonna use a, a, some notation now. We're gonna talk about regular dyadic partitions of the, the unit interval, call them Pn. And remember this extensive numerical evidence? Well, I'm gonna tell you a bit more about this extensive numerical evidence. If you actually go out and use a mirror variationally, 
you've got to use a variation of principle to get the right mirror to study one of these quantum phase transitions, you notice a strange pattern. As you get closer to this critical point, the correct mirror for your system acquires a kind of self-similar structure. You, you really get this pattern of, of tensor networks as you get closer and closer to the quantum phase transition. And th that I can't prove that to you. I can just report that this is what happens. Every time you look at a quantum phase transition, you build the sequence of mirror closer and closer to the phase transition. You find the best one. It has this structure. It just is so. I'd love to prove it, but I can't. U and V are scale independent in this case, yeah. Uh, and let's just say we this is give this thing a name, right? Let's just say it's scale invariant, what physicists like to do. And uh, what does that mean? Well, mathematically, I would invite you to think of scale invariant as like an equivalence relation. You know, one thing is equivalent to the other in this sequence. And if you do that, then you're led to observing some extra data. And this extra data can be extracted as follows. A sequence such as the one I drew yields not only the sequence of states, but a family of isometries, TLM, which run from this coarser Hilbert space to this finer Hilbert space. And these TLMs have the property that if you have a coarse mirror, then you can produce a finer mirror for the system closer to criticality. This is observed. I, I cannot prove this to you, but I, time and time again, we see this. And then this is how it, how it manifests in tensor network diagrams. You have your mirror, you do your summatory, and then poof, you get your mirror for the, the, the state closer to the quantum phase transition. Now, and, and then what do these isometries look like? Well, they just look like these U's and V's, or products thereof. So what is a quantum phase transition? Well, how about I give you a definition? Well, the kinematical space for a quantum phase transition, what is it? Well, it's, it's going to be a... Uh, uh, a bunch of Hilbert spaces for lattices of different lattice spacing. Remember, we have to sort of deal with the fact that the correlation length is growing, the lattice spacing is decreasing. It's determined by a direct, it's a directed system with Hilbert spaces. I don't even need to dwell on this slide very much because I think you're all familiar with this kind of definition. With this extra data of these isometries, this is just a directed system of isometries. So we're like, right, you know, now we're getting somewhere because then we can just use that to build this direct limit. And this is, this is how I came to this object that, that Vaughan uh, was talking about this morning, but was via these observations. And I mean, uh, yeah, uh, this is for the, the benefit of my physicist colleagues, but I, I mean, I don't need to dwell on this definition, I think. So what, what are the residents of this space physically? Well, they are sequences of states of the system approaching a second order quantum phase transition. So anything in this equivalence class here, you can think of as just a state somewhere along the line of getting to that quantum phase transition, in this ex it, it, where the equivalence notion is that of the scale invariant. And, yeah, I'm out of time, and I'm not going to be able to make good on my promise on telling you uh, how to do the scaling limit properly, because th this is only half the story. That's the kinematics. We want to talk about the dynamics. And to do that, we have this problem of dealing with the observables in the system. What's the right observables we allow ourselves to measure? I'll only make one observation. The one set of observables you might at attach to such a system is just V of H, right? But I claim that that's unphysically large, right? There's an extra physics we have to do before we can get an interesting class of observables for our system. And why is it unphysically large? Because it somehow sees the underlying lattice. There's no cost in, in this, this operator space here. I'm allowed to do any observation I like, and that, that's allowed to probe the system on any length that it likes. There's no notion of cost there. And to, to introduce this notion of cost, we want to find somehow a sub set of this observable algebra to measure distances. We want to build some locally convex topological vector space using just, say, V topology determined by this subset. What properties does this subset need physically? Now, this is fascinating. It needs to be an Archimedean ordered unit space, nothing more. We don't need for it to be an operator algebra. Now, that's a, th that should just be the teaser for many other discussions that we could have. So actually, I think with that, it's probably best to stop. I have lots to say as you can see, but I'll just stop with this slide here. Thank you very much.
then you take pure four, yeah. So, you know, it's, 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 it's really good for it's, it, it, I, the analogy I like to use again is, 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 is the it's three, it's three, <laughs> it's three dimension. That's ad admittedly true, admittedly true. But if you look at, if you, if you model, the way we look at quantum spin systems in experiments is we do neutron scattering. So we take the spin system and we, we throw a beam of neutrons at it and see what happens. And you get diffraction patterns too. I think I have a picture here. No, I, I got rid of it. So there, there's this, the actually when we observe a quantum spin system, we don't get to see the, the individual spins. And the, the, the closest we can probe them at is more or less the quantum wavelength of these neutron beams. And so that is actually quite large relative to the, the, the lattice spaces. So uh, the observations we do up to now haven't been able to resolve them. However, that's changing with dilute atomic gases where you're allowed to drop these ensembles through a sheet of light. And then you can actually sort of get dissolved single particles. So I, I'm, I'm kind of in one dimension, I'm kind of halfway to what we get. You can go backwards, yeah. So I'll answer that question in two parts. So I don't want the observables to have the fractal structure because I think that physically we don't expect them. We don't, when we do our experiments, we don't see the fractal structure. So that, that on physical grounds, I would sort of not want that. Um, about the going backwards, that's, I think what you're implying is uh, the construction of a thing called a parent Hamiltonian. Suppose you have a self-similar state, sequence of states as I've just defined. Is there a model which has this sequence as the exact ground state? You can do that, yes. There exist models. And do you observe phase Do you observe phase transitions for them? Uh, I would have said no a year ago, but yes now. <laughs> so we, this is new results. Yep. Yeah. Uh, how does, what, sorry? I would love to relate this to constructive quantum field theory, wouldn't I just? I don't know what the continuum theory is that I'm building here. I'm still struggling in the dark. I would love to connect it to, say, conformal nets. I think that's a very attractive thing to want to go for, right? You know, maybe this data is enough to give us a conformal net sort of 10 steps down the line. Uh, so we do. We do have a semi-group action in the background, namely changing scale. And it's not continuous. That's for reasons that, for the same reasons that actually Vaughan and so we want to make it continuous. And the only way I think we can do that is by weakening the topology that we use to measure differences <coughs> in our vector space. This topology is too fine. And until we weaken it the right way, the right by right, I mean physically right, then this, these actions will always be discontinuous. Yep. Yes. Yes. So for these mirrors, you can extract. Uh, conformal dimensions by solving a, an associated thing called an ascending tunnel problem. And that gives you exactly the conformal weights. You can get the operator product expansions, the coefficients. You can get all this data. None of this is rigorous. I mean, I can just tell you, I can find the data, compare it to the, the, the continuum theory that I think is correct and see that they match. Do you always mean Oh, I pretty much always mean that because first order is out. First order, that's really weird, right? First order phase transitions, they have a jump in the energy. I think that, that, that means you're forming bound states. I mean, it's really crazy, first order phase transitions. Uh, and they don't, we don't know if, uh, how to make a model of continuum there. Third order, I know they exist in supersymmetric theory, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, N no, 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 that's a fantastic question, actually. So um, th these continuum theories may or may not give unitary representations of the Poincaré group. So they may or may not. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But that's not a bad thing. I mean, we know physical systems where the dynamic equivalent of critical exponent isn't two, is not one, it's two. And these are very sort of interesting continuum theories. So I, I think, yeah, may and may not. Is this the only answer? <laughs> Thank you very much.